In this quick little animation, you just saw how one cell can become part of something much greater than itself. And in this case, we can use this stack of blocks um, as an example of a multicellular organism. So what we're going to do with today's talk is we're going to take a look and see how animals are organized. In fact, we're going to see how organisms are built from cells that are part of groups that carry a same specialization, a same function. A common theme in biology is that form fits function. So what that says is that biological structures and even biological organisms can be shaped to fit the ecological role they play or possibly the physiological role they play. Now, what does all that mean? Well, it could mean that, you know, if you look into a certain type of environment, you'll find animals that are shaped a specific way because the pressures of the environment have pop over years and years, change that population and become successful in a very particular form. Now, what we can also say is internally, inside of an organism, it's going to have tissues and structures that are going to aid its survival in some way. And we'll see multiple examples of that um, further into this talk. So, from the world of anatomy and physiology, anatomy just basically means biological form, and physiological, uh, physiology means biological function. So if form fits function, the anatomy will fit the physiology of either the whole organism or part of that organism. Let's take a look at a, just some really easy examples like body shape. If we look at things that are found underwater, we tend to find that they all kind of have a similar shape. Not all of them, but many of them do. And that shape can be referred to as fusiform, or tapered at both ends. So let's look at some examples. If we take a look at this tuna here, notice that it does have a tapered end on one end and a tapered end on the other. But then again, so does this penguin. And so does this seal. So they don't even have to be from the same family of animals, and they seem if they need to get somewhere underwater fast, they all seem to take on a very similar form. Now, when multiple species from different avenues of phylogeny come together, they do so by a result of convergent evolution. And what that means is that multiple species can wind up essentially with the same shape, looking the same and fitting the same role in a particular environment, and that's based on selective pressures. Those selective pressures will allow evolution to really take hold and provide a form that is going to allow that particular species to be extremely successful. We can also look at internal examples. One of them is that organisms need to exchange substances both inward and outward. So if we, take, if we imagine that this is a cell down here, we'll say this is a plant cell, and it needs to get certain nutrients in. It needs to get CO2 in, and it needs to get water in. But it also has waste products um, that are produced from the metabolism of the cell, and those need to get out. So the shape of the cell and the shape sometimes of the organism can aid in the efficiency of getting stuff in and out. One of the things that can help uh, with an entire organism is being flat. So there is an organism, it's called a flatworm, and a flatworm kind of has that fusiform type shape, but the flatworm is also very, very thin. It's only a few cell layers thick, which means that it doesn't have to have an entire circulatory system, but instead it can absorb nutrients from the outside and get rid of waste very, very quickly from the few cells that make up its um, entire body. Um, cell having folds, that's another thing. So when you look at a lot of structures of the insides of organisms, what you're going to find is this kind of shape here. And these folds are going to allow surface area to greatly be increased. Because if we were to pull these folds out from either end, this way and this way, what you're going to find is that it has a surface area probably about that long. So by folding it up, you can have a lot of surface area in a very small space. We also know that cells are limited by their surface area to volume ratio. So each one of these cells is relatively constant in size. Why? How come there's not any super big cells? Well, the reason is because cells have to bring in nutrients at a certain rate, but they also need to get rid of waste at a certain rate. 
the larger you get in size, the bigger the volume is of that cell and you wind up either starving yourself or poisoning yourself with waste because the diffusion rate is not fast enough and that much fluid. So that's why cells tend to be pretty small for the most part because it allows for maximum efficiency in bringing substances in and out. Here's a couple of other examples of, whoops, here we go. Um, we have an amoeba, which is currently exchanging things in and out. It's going to be limited to a certain size to aid that. And over here, we have another small little critter. This is a freshwater hydra. And this hydra is only a couple cell layers thick. So here we have an outer layer and we have an inner layer and there's kind of a basement membrane between the two. So there's some exchange happening on the outside and there's some exchange happening on the inside. Very efficient, uh, perfectly fitting for where this animal lives and uh, it's able to uh, be very successful on an evolutionary basis because of its body, body size, because it's able to exchange those um, waste products and those nutrients very readily. All right, so we also know that organisms are intimately connected to water. Internal body fluids connect exchange surfaces to body cells, and that's going to happen through interstitial fluid. Okay, so let's take a look at our structure over here. Again, we'll say that each one of these blocks is a cell. So between and all these cracks right here, we also have water. Um, now, it's not pure water. It's going to be interstitial fluid, which means that it's going to be full of ions. There's going to be some proteins in there. Um, so it's going to be a biological fluid, but it's going to exist between all of these cells. And that's what's going to allow nutrients to get in and waste products to be washed away. In the beginning of biology, we looked at biological levels of organization. So we started at the very small and we kind of did some building up. And what was important is that we saw that there were emergent properties that occurred at each level of complexity. So let's look at this picture as an example. So down in the most basic level, we have the atom. And we all know that the atom, there's 118 of them. They're all found on the periodic table. Um, so there's different elements. But this atom here, by itself, can only do certain things. It can bond to whatever other atom that might fulfill its octet. So um, currently it might be unhappy, but once it finds another atom, it's happy. So that is the, that is the atomic level of organization. Once you throw a few atoms together, though, you can then form what's called a molecule. And a molecule has its own set of properties. So it might do some bonding itself with things that it's attracted to. Um, it might have some intermolecular forces amongst other things that it's surrounded by. And once you throw a few molecules together, you can then get on the order of cellular. And when I say few, if we're talking about molecules to cells, we're going to be talking about a little bit more than a few millions to even billions of molecules together to make up an entire cell. And right here, we've now reached the basic unit of life. Here's a plant cell and here's a nerve cell. And both of them do all of the characteristics of life that we learned um, first thing when we were together on that big wheel. Okay, um, from your cellular level, now we're going to kind of graduate and move up one more where we have a whole bunch of those cells working together to perform a common function. And that's what we call the tissue level. And we'll be focusing on this quite a bit today. Now, we can't, you don't have to stop there. Once you put a whole bunch of tissues that coordinate function in some way, you can then reach the organ level. So here we went from a nerve cell to a nervous tissue, and now we have an entire organ. In this case, it would be the brain of this elephant. If we go over to the plant side over here, we have a single cell. Here we have a layer of cells. This might be found inside of a leaf here. Maybe it's the palisade layer. And then here we have a cross section of the leaf itself, which is uh, you have your palisade layer, you have your spongy mesophyll, and this whole structure right here is going to allow for that plant to do some photosynthesizing. If we move up one more level and we throw some organs together that work in a coordinated function, we can reach the, there we go, the organ system level. So now there's not only a brain here in the elephant, but you also see this highlighted spinal cord there as well. And here we see a twig with a whole bunch of leaves on it. And then once you put enough 
organ systems together and they're working together cooperatively, of course you can reach the organism level. We have a complete organism here of its own species. It can reproduce with its own kind to produce offspring. But I think today's talk, we're going to stick more down here to the cellular and tissue level. All right, so let's take a look at some of these types of tissues. All right, tissues, once again, they're composed of specialized cells of the same type that work together to perform a function in the body. All right, first thing we're looking at here is connective tissue. And connective tissue, you can see right here, we're taking it from this part of the body. There's not much going on here in terms of uh, unique things that we're seeing, but we do see these big white blobby cells. And what these are, they're fat cells. So connective tissue is made of fat cells, that's part of it, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff in these red portions here, which we'll get to in a minute. Next, nervous tissue. You can see right here we're focusing in on this man's brain. And in here you see all kinds of red and you see some black things. Well, in this uh, picture here, in this view in, the black things are called neurons and they are part of your nervous system. They're your nerve cells. Next, we have cardiac muscle from, yes, you got it, the heart right here. So these cardiac muscles, they're formed in, uh, you'll see these tissues in layers. They coordinate together because they got to give you a functioning heartbeat. They all have to beat together at the same time. We also see smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found here. You can see this is this man's small intestine. And smooth muscle is made of tissue that's organized in a very specific way. We'll look at that in a little bit as well. Um, next, we have epithelial tissue. So right here from the man's forearm, we see um, a pink layer here and we see a red layer there. So one thing that we're going to see is how these different tissues are organized. And the interesting thing about your epithelial layer on the outside is it can be made of 20 to 30 layers of skin cells where only the bottom few layers have life to them. And as they start going upward from the base layer, they start losing their nucleus and actually dying. So most of the layers of skin you have are actually dead on the surface. But that's really important too because it provides you protection from abrasions. And last but not least, we have skeletal muscle. And here we see the man's bicep. And we see, uh, as we look into the uh, viewfinder here, the viewfinder window, you can see little tiny stripes. And we'll talk about those in a little bit as well. It's uh, called striated skeletal muscle. So we mentioned epithelial tissue. We said it was found on the outside of the body but it's also on the inside of the body. It can line your organs and cavities. It contains cells that are closely joined to each other. It can be protective, but it can also do some secretion, absorption, filtering, and excreting substances. So it does a lot of different jobs physiologically inside your body. And they have different shapes. Let's take a look at some of them. First, we have cuboidal. And that makes sense because the shape is like a dice. Uh, second, columnar. Think of the word column. So it's like a brick standing on its end, so it's rectangular. And there's also squamous, which are flat like floor tiles. So if we take a look at them here, uh, starting from the top, we see our squamous. These are more flat than they are tall. Um, we have cuboidal, and that makes sense. And then we have simple columnar epithelium. So notice we have these little tiny folds all over the surface. And like we said before, they are going to aid in absorption as they give this more surface area for doing that. Now, along with those terms, we can throw some other words with it. Um, and these words relate to how many layers there are. So a simple squamous cell or a simple squamous layer, a simple cuboidal, means that there's one line of them. If you have stratified, stratified alludes to layers. So you have multiple layers or tiers of cells. And then the third one is called pseudostratified, a single layer of varying width. So pseudostratified will often look like it's multiple layers, but it isn't. And I'll show you that in one second. All right, so here we have cuboidal. And you'll notice in this case here, where it's coming from is this little structure right there, which is this wolf's kidney. And what's going to happen here are these kidney tubules are going to absorb and secrete different substances and allow this wolf to filter its blood. 
A stratified layer is one where you have multiple layers of cells. So here we have stratified squamous epithelium. And if we take a look at the wolf right here, it is pointing to this wolf's esophagus. Now, why would it have multiple layers of cells in the esophagus? Well, if you think of what a wolf eats, um, it's going to be some pretty harsh meals, and there might be some scraping of whatever it kills and then swallows as it travels down the esophagus. So if it's going to take cells with it, it's going to help if you have a lot of layers there that can be spent as this wolf eats, and they can be regenerated very easily. Pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, wow, that is a big name. But if you take a look at this, uh, this little cutout here, notice that all of these cells go from top to bottom. Even if their shape is weird, they still reach top to bottom, even though it looks like they end, uh, that they have multiple layers. So this little cell right here, you can see its nucleus. However, we don't see where it reaches the top, but it does reach the top. It just happens to be behind a couple cells. So they have strange shapes, but they all wind up going from top to bottom. So we call them pseudostratified. Um, and in this case, it is pointing to this wolf's trachea and you'll notice that it has uh, little tiny hairs little projections cilia on it and why would those be there because it helps sweep out any debris so lining this these will cells will also secrete mucus and the little cilia will sweep any debris that gets down into the trachea of this wolf and maybe the wolf will cough it up and and that way it won't get further down into the lungs and hurt this wolf's respiratory system um, going back to uh, the simple, where there's just one layer, um, in this case here, it's pointing to this wolf's small intestine. So these cells, like the pseudostratified, they also have little projections on their surface, which is going to aid this wolf in digesting all it can from its meals. And um, a simple squamous epithelium, this one here, is pointing at the wolf's lungs, and that's going to be good for um, gas exchange. So if you just have one layer, it's going to be much easier for gases um, to diffuse in and out of that tissue. I also wrote at the bottom, notice the purple layer present in many of the diagrams. Usually the floor that anchors these cells is going to be called um, basement membrane. And if we take a look, whoops, went too far. Right here, the basement membrane has different regions of it. Here we have an apical surface and that just means a kind of the topmost surface and it often has projections sticking off of these cells. It might be cilia, um, it might be villi um, folds again to improve and increase surface area. There's the basal surface which anchors it to this lamina and a lamina is a dense mat of ECM. Okay, ECM is the extracellular matrix. All right, now the extracellular matrix is full of all kinds of things, uh, proteins, cells that are embedded, um, immune cells. Uh, we'll take a look at that right now because there's so much going on there. So here we have an example of ECM. So this is uh, the extracellular matrix that we're finding down here below this basement membrane. And it is made of what we call connective tissue says it mainly binds and supports other tissues, and it contains sparsely packed cells scattered through that extracellular matrix. All right, so what do we got in here? Well, we got all kinds of stuff. Here's an adipose cell, also known as a fat cell, a plasma cell from your immune system, a mast cell, which is going to release histamine if it is injured or if it has an allergic response. Another immune helper is this macrophage here. A fibroblast is going to secrete a lot of the protein fibers that you see down here. Um, so there's really a lot happening beneath that basement membrane once you get into the extracellular matrix. And again, this ECM is what we consider connective tissue. Uh, it has kind of a liquid, jelly-like, and solid foundation. So it's just kind of a mishmash of everything. But it has to be just right for that organism to function properly. There's other types of connective tissues out there which have um, a main basis of protein. Let's take a look at some of the types of connective tissue. Uh, first, we have collagen. And collagen fibers provide a lot of strength and flexibility for structures in that ECM. 
We have another one called reticular fibers. These are going to join your connective tissue to the adjacent tissues next to them, made of very thin, almost lace-like structures. And then lastly, we see elastic fibers. We see some down here. Um, these are the stretchy kinds of uh, proteins in your body. So, you know, if you pull certain parts of your um, of your skin, say, for example, your ear, if you pull your ear, we know that it's going to snap back to its current state. And that's because it has a lot of elastic fibers um, within those structures. All right, so um, let's get into more types of connective tissue, um, some official categories here, and we'll start with loose connective tissue. And here, uh, this connective tissue, you can see it's pointing right in front of the muscle in this dog's leg, and it's right in the middle of some fat tissue. So this is very typical of what we've been talking about with the extracellular matrix. Um, and this is what we uh, will categorize as loose connective tissue. Second, dense connective tissue or fibrous connective tissue. If you look at this part right here, this white tissue, you can see it. it's very dense. Uh, looks like there's a lot of fibers very tightly wound together. And this is the stuff of tendons. This is the stuff that connects muscles to bones. Next, we have bone tissue. So bone is actually a type of connective tissue as well. It's made of a, of a cylinder-like shape, multiple cylinder like shapes, which are called osteons or haversion systems, and uh, we'll learn more about those in a little bit. We have cartilage. Cartilage is pointing to the joint between, in this case, these two uh, bone structures right here. You can see this white covering, and that is the cartilage, and cartilage has a type of cell inside of it called a chondrocyte. Next, we have adipose tissue. Once again, um, these are the fat cells right underneath the surface of your skin. And lastly, a connective tissue, which doesn't sound like it would be, but blood is actually a connective tissue. If you think about it, it connects everything in your body. Um, it's made of formed elements floating in a liquid, um, a liquid portion called plasma. And here we can see some a lot of red blood cells. These are all the dark ones. Then you see three purple ones. Those are your white blood cells. Okay, so um, getting specific and analytical here, we can say that in vertebrates, the fibers and foundation combine to form six major types of connective tissue divided into three big categories. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that last slide's details and we're going to throw it together here. So the first category is fibrous connective tissue, and we saw the loose connective tissue, again, underneath the skin. It was part of the extracellular matrix. It binds epithelia to underlying tissues and holds organs in place. Second, we saw this type of tissue, adipose tissue, made of fat cells, stores fat for insulation, fuel, and cushions organs. And third, dense fibrous connective tissue, we saw the tendon, which connected the muscle to the bone, and we also have ligaments in that group, which connect bone-to-bone -bone connections. So tendons actually will allow your muscle to adhere to a bone, whereas your ligaments are going to connect bone-to-bone -bone and give it that strength and structural integrity that we need at our joint regions. All right, so here again, we have some adipose tissue. That's these big white ones. And in between them, we see a whole bunch of loose connective tissue as well. Down here, we see a tendon. In this case, it looks like a quadricep, and it's attached uh, to, in this case, the patella. And down here, we see the ligament. We see the MCL, the medial collateral ligament. So possibly you know a friend who may have got injured, hurt their ACL, their MCL, their PCL. All of those are possible with with um, knee injuries when somebody moves too quickly laterally or sometimes falls down on their knee they can snap these ligaments and of course they need to be repaired all right second major category is supportive connective tissue so cartilage is definitely a supportive connective tissue it's strong it's flexible um, the, it has cells, those chondrocytes, that lie in chambers. These chambers are called lacunae. So let's take a look at three types of cartilage that we have. 
First, we have hyaline cartilage, which is shiny, hard cartilage found at the ends of bones that articulate at joints. So if you take a look at this example here, you can see that the end of the femur in this case and the top of the tibia have this shiny looking cartilage on the end. And that's what hyaline cartilage is like. Think of the last time if you're a meat eater that you ate a chicken leg. On the end of the bone, you saw that really shiny, smooth material. That's hyaline cartilage. Next, we have fibrocartilage. It, this type of cartilage is filled with white collagen. And you'll see that it kind of crisscrosses here. And it almost seems very tightly wound together. And this is found in your intervertebral disc in your, in your spine and also your knee joint as well. And third, we have elastic cartilage, which is very flexible. High number of elastic fibers are present. So we said if you pull on your earlobe, we know it's going to snap back in place. Also, your larynx also will have the same type of tissue here. So um, when we um, make sounds, our vocal cords are going to move, but they're going to snap back in position due to the high amount of elastin present. All right, let's focus in on bone for a second. With bone, two-thirds of the extracellular matrix is mineralized or very hard. These are made of calcium salts that are going to be deposited around collagen fibers. So what are bones for? Well, we know they're for support, protection. They're points of attachment for our muscles. They're a mineral reservoir. So from inside of the bones, Hopefully you've learned that you have bone marrow, which takes up the central portion of bones. And, of course, support of red blood cell production from that marrow. So typically our stem cells will come from this area here in the hollow middle portion of the bones. All right, taking a closer look at bones, if we really want to get inside, let's take a look at some of the structures. The outside of the bone area, the very hard, dense part, this is called compact bone. So if we look at this here, that would be this outer area here, right there. That is our compact bone. Its basic structural unit is going to be the osteon. Here one is pulled up and out. But if you look down at the picture here, you're going to notice these concentric circles. That's what these osteons are. They are just numbers of cylinders that each has their own blood supply and each traps a number of bone cells which are called osteocytes on the inside of it. So these osteocytes, they're going to find these little uh, open pool areas called lacunae and there they're just going to kind of live their life almost like they're trapped in a little jail cell and there they're going to get nutrients from the blood supply, they're going to get rid of their waste and their job is basically producing bone tissue. So where does their blood supply come from? Well, little tiny horizontal channels called canaliculi. They connect each of the lacuna with blood vessels. So this little dark spot right here, one of these lacuna, lacunae, they are going to receive their own little blood supply from, and here you can see some lines on this structure right there, and those would be your canaliculi. Here's a, a nicer view of that. Uh, each dark spot represents a one of these lacuna that has the trapped osteocytes but you'll notice that they're not completely closed off instead there's all these little tiny lines here and that's what's going to allow them to exchange fluids with the cells around them all right the other part of bone is the central portion called spongy bone and spongy bone is everything here on the inside the compact bone is this stuff here on the outside and spongy bones have, as you can see, there's all kinds of these little tiny um, structural girders on the inside. And they're called trabeculae right here. They provide strength for your bones and they provide a place for the marrow to accumulate. Now, these little tiny lines that you see in there, they're not permanent. Whatever stress you wind up putting on a bone, these lines will react to that stress, sometimes changing direction. Like if you, let's say you lived a sedentary lifestyle and all of a sudden you said, okay, I'm going to take up power lifting. And you started adding some major stress to your bones. Your bones are not fixed in place. Instead, they're going to change over time and adapt to the stressors that you put on them. The marrow also will contain reticular tissue that contains cell, stem cells for making those blood cells. So we saw reticular tissue a little bit earlier. 
And uh, we mentioned the trabeculae giving internal support for uh, the bones when they're put under stress. All right, the third major category of connective tissue is the fluid connective tissue, which can only be the blood. All right, so the blood has two parts. It has what we call formed elements, which is basically from here down, which is all the solid stuff that you find in blood. For example, erythrocytes, better known as RBCs or red blood cells. We have leukocytes, your white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are your platelets. These are going to make up about 45% of your blood. The other 55%, as you can see right here, is plasma. And plasma is the liquid fluid that your all your blood cells, your formed elements, float in. Red, red blood cells, as we said earlier, they're made in the bone marrow in a process called hematopoiesis, and we'll hit on that in a different lecture. But the function of blood is basically transport. You gotta get stuff where it needs to go. Whether you're talking about respiratory gases, O2 and CO2, whether you're talking about nutrients or whether you're talking about waste, all that stuff has to get somewhere, and blood is gonna make that happen. Okay. So next, we'll take a look at different types of muscle tissue. It consists of long cells containing contractile fibers, which are usually made of proteins, which contract in response to nerve signals. All right, so the first type we'll look at here is called cardiac muscle. And of course, that's going to come from your heart, this organ right here. Notice the striation, uh, the striated appearance that you see here. Um, that is going to be... Um, functionally important because we have to have open communication within the cells uh, within the cells of the heart we need to have something called a gap junction in place and that gap junction is going to allow for uh, fluid to flow through multiple cells at a time so we can get a coordinated beating of the heart and they do that by sharing the same fluids by sharing the same signal system and we want the heart to work as what's called a syncytium which that means that everything is working together in the proper rhythm we also have skeletal muscle and again we see these bands right here and these bands are going to extend and contract just like we saw with the heart and um, sometimes your muscle cells, your skeletal muscle cells, can be multinucleate. They can have multiple nuclei in the same cell. And other times there's just one per cell. But the whole thing is that the cells shorten and elongate. And they shorten when you contract them. They elongate when you relax them. And skeletal muscles are all voluntary movement. We think about it, we do it. Um, the only involuntary thing that uh, typically we think about is breathing. And the third one we have is smooth muscle. And smooth muscle, you can see, hey, we have fusiform again. So we have these uh, uh, fusiform-shaped cells. And these cells also have a different mechanisms besides just opening and closing this way. Um, their internal proteins kind of are shaped like they crisscross the whole way down through the cell. And when they come together, they kind of squish together and they go from an elongated state to more of a rounded state. And um, that is how peristalsis is controlled. So when we eat, um, we have smooth muscles surrounding our stomach, surrounding our small intestine, our large intestine, and they're going to help push food through and that type of movement is going to be all involuntary typically when i eat something i'll think okay come on stomach churn it up and start digesting that whatever i just ate we don't need to do that it's all involuntary Okay, a um, few things to point out in this slide here. We have skeletal muscle. Of course, that's going to be part of, uh, you know, in this dog, it's, uh, the, this wolf, it's leg. Uh, we have the smooth muscle here coming from its small intestine, and we have the cardiac muscle coming from its heart. Um, zeroing in on some of the things we find in the skeletal muscle. Here again are those striations we were talking about. Here's multiple nuclei in the same cell. And what's going to happen um, in these small little units, it's really tough to see, but there's actually kind of a shape that looks like this that's pointing to one dark line to the next dark line. And what that is called is a sarcomere. It's a functional unit of a muscle. And that sarcomere is going to contract and the two dark lines are going to move towards each other. And that's going to happen for the length of the whole muscle, which means it's going to very much shorten up so you know you can extend your arm and as you flex your bicep notice how much shorter and taller that muscle gets um, here we have um, 
a portion of your cardiac muscle, again, you can see these long bands, which are actually going to contract in a similar way to the smooth, uh, to the skeletal muscle. But we also have these intercalated discs, which allow for uh, ions and fluid to pass through from one cell to another, because you have to have that coordinated effort for the heartbeat to work together as a group. And lastly, we have the smooth muscle down here, again, elongated cells and uh, kind of have a different type of contraction, but essentially they will get shorter and rounder as they do contract. Okay, and uh, another tissue we can mention, of course, is your nervous tissue. And your nervous tissue is filled with cells called neurons. Those are your nerve cells. Um, they transmit the nerve impulses. Here we have a few structures that are highlighted. Dendrites, which are like branches on a tree. Cell body is the main part. And then axon is this long extension that comes out of the cell body. And it has another end um, that would be somewhere down here. And the whole job of a neuron is to relay nerve signals. And in a minute, we'll talk about how that happens. Uh, nervous tissue also has these cells here called glial cells and these are going to help nourish, insulate, and replenish neurons. So actually neurons are kind of outnumbered like five to one by these glial cells. Um, so there's a lot of them and they support a healthy set of neural nets inside of your brain. So they are kind of like the, the uh, heroes of the brain that don't get as much press as the actual nerve cells themselves. All right, so taking a closer look at the neurons, we mentioned dendrites, cell body, and axon. And what we can talk about is the direction of the nerve impulse. So here, this is the collection area for stimulation that's going to um, happen to this nerve cell. Here is the cell body where that stimulation is assessed. And if the signal is strong enough, then it can allow for that message to be passed on to the next neuron, and that happens down the axon. So the direction of the nerve impulse in this case is going to be from the top, and if it is strong enough, it is going to continue and propagate down this nerve cell to the next nerve cell. Okay, a couple of uh, just random um questions that I need to answer here. Okay, so we've talked about tissues. We said once enough of them are together and they perform a common function, they then can become an organ. So what is an organ? Well, an organ is nothing more than two or more types of tissue that work together to perform a specific function. And then an organ system was one more step up that ladder when you have multiple organs that cooperate in order to carry out a process. So think of skin. Why is skin considered an organ? Well, if you look at um, the information here, there's multiple tissues that make up skin. You have epidermis, you have dermis, accessory organs within this skin. What are those? Well, you have sweat glands, you have sebaceous glands that secrete sebum. Um, you even have little nerves in there. Um, if someone feels like, you know, a hair on your arm, you can perceive that. There is perception there. And you even have little muscles. Last time, think of last time you were scared and all the hairs stood on end on your body. Well, it took little tiny erector pili muscles for that to happen. If we take a look at skin, look at all of this stuff going on in here. There is tons of stuff happening from Pacinian corpuscles, which are going to feel pressure um, to these glands here that are going to secrete onto the surface. So here's a sweat gland down here. You have your top layer, your epidermis. Underneath it, you have connective tissue, the loose connective tissue made of the extracellular matrix. There is a lot going on in skin. It's the biggest organ you have on your body. So what was this talk about? Well, it's basically about how cells can accumulate in groups, perform a common function, and be then labeled as a tissue. Once you have enough tissues together, you can then become an organ. Once you have enough organs in place and they work together, you can have an organ system. So it starts at the simplest level at one cell. And once a lot of cells are together, we then start branching into the different types of tissues that we learned today. So I hope this helped you understand tissue and organization a little bit better. Keep studying. I'll talk to you next time. Bye.